The Battle of the Trebia was Hannibal's first major engagement with Rome. But how had this come about? Who were the major figures that day? And how did the events of the battle unfold? Join me as I discuss all of this and much more on the Ancient History Hound podcast. Hi, and welcome to the Ancient History Hound podcast. I'm your host, my name's Neil. And as you might already know, you can find me on Twitter as at Ancient Blogger. And this podcast now has its own handle, at Hound Ancient. So feel free to come and say hi. But I don't just tweet. I also have a website, ancientblogger.com. And here you can find links to my Instagram, YouTube, as well as more ancient history content, including notes for this episode. And for the first time, a transcription of this episode. Recently, I've shamelessly joined TikTok as Ancient Blogger, but have no fears. Much like my YouTube and Instagram, it's all just ancient history content with a few dogs, not a dance move in sight. What really helps is if you can rate or review this on the platform you're listening to, and it now includes that option on Spotify. So with all that said and done, what can you expect from this episode? To help give the Battle of Trebia some context, I'll be exploring the events which led up to it, as well as other aspects, for example, the characters involved, and how Hannibal exploited both the political and geographical landscape to his advantage. And of course, you know, the battle itself. So I hope this will give you a more informed and hopefully a bit more of an interesting experience. Two final things then, just before we start. The events occurred in the 3rd century BCE, so take it as read that any date I mention is BC or BCE, unless I mention otherwise. Call me lazy, but it just feels nice not having to say BCE or BC all the time. And for the purposes of practicality and, honestly, not just being lazy, I've used the word Celt a few times. Where applicable, I do mention specific tribes, but I take this term as a catch-all for a range of separate tribes who are often grouped together under this simple word. OK, I think that's everything, so I'll begin. In the spring of 218, either April or May, a Carthaginian general called Hannibal left camp and began a march which would result in him fighting deep in the Italian peninsula. He couldn't have known that in the space of a few years he'd bring about defeats on Rome which became near legendary. This included the Battle of Cannae, which is still studied today in the context of military perfection. He'd make a huge impression both on Rome and on the history books. The phrase Hannibal at the gates became a term used by Romans to invoke the scariest of propositions and scare the odd Roman child. Hannibal was Carthaginian. He was from North Africa, yet the first step he made on the march wasn't trod on African soil. Instead, it was on Spanish. And this might be surprising, but by 218, Carthage had established a base of operations there, almost a mini kingdom to the southeast of the Iberian Peninsula. The reasons for this are complex and actually form the content of an episode I recorded a few years ago called Costa del Carthage. See what I did there? I won't go into too much detail now, but I do think it's worth providing some form of an overview because much of what happens now is linked to what happened during and after the First Punic War. Between 264 and 241, Rome and Carthage fought each other to near exhaustion in a series of battles, most often naval ones, in and around Sicily. This island was a prize worth fighting over. Strategically, just look at a map and see how important it was for a growing Roman state. But there were resources there, and it was also a fabulous trading hub. Prior to the war, Sicily had largely been contested by the Greeks and Carthaginians before Rome ultimately joined in, and Rome were ultimately the victors. The Treaty of Lutatius followed, and this was negotiated by Hamilcar Barca, a general who'd been a continual thorn in the Roman side on Sicily. As Rome had won the treaty, it was on their terms, and two outcomes are notable for the context of this episode. That Carthage had to exit Sicily, and they were to pay Rome a hefty war indemnity. Hamilcar returned to Carthage and faced a political landscape full of enemies, even though he'd put down a rebellion of unpaid mercenaries and helped save Carthage from them. What Carthage needed was a way to replenish its finances and build up its prestige once more, and there was one place to do this, the southern Iberian Peninsula, or modern-day southern Spain. Carthage was originally a Phoenician colony, and the Phoenicians, hailing from modern-day Lebanon, had set up various trading posts and colonies across the Mediterranean, for example, Cadiz. Through this network, Carthage knew that southern Spain was very wealthy in terms of what could be mined there, particularly silver. 
with the trading posts they had knowledge of the tribes and a lot of the information which made the next move a sound choice. We don't know the exact motivations for why in 237 Hamilcar headed to Cadiz with a small force, but the chance to restore their fortunes and restore Carthaginian pride and power seemed the most logical. And joining Hamilcar on this journey to Spain was his nine-year-old son, Hannibal. Roll forward a few years and what had resulted was a Carthaginian base, Carthago Nova or modern day Cartagena. Hamilcar had been every bit as successful as he could have hoped in both winning over the local Iberian tribes or just beating them. After he died, his son-in-law Hasdrubal took over, and when he died, it was Hannibal's turn. By this point, Hannibal had accumulated the sort of experience which was to make a lot of what he achieved possible. War with Rome was seemingly something Hannibal inherited from his father, and in 218 this was formalised by a famous Roman embassy sent to Carthage and this followed Hannibal's siege of Saguntum, a settlement on the east coast of Iberia. Fabius Maximus stated to the Carthaginian Senate that he had war or peace in the folds of his toga, and it was up to them to choose. The result was war. Hannibal's objective wasn't to defend against an imminent Roman attack or fight them in a disputed area. His military experience had been a conquest and expansion in the heartland of the enemy. He would therefore be visiting the Italian peninsula. Why didn't he sail his army across the Mediterranean? Surely it would be far easier than just walking all the way. Well, in some ways it would be, but only if you could magic up a huge fleet of ships, guarantee that the weather would hold throughout the trip. Remember, those ships laden with supplies and men would sit low in the water, and therefore the smallest of storms could cause absolute mayhem. You'd also need to avoid the Roman navies, which would again find these ships laden with supplies and soldiers easy pickings and presumably keep the massive shipbuilding you were doing or that conjured up fleet secret from Rome. Finally, when you got to Italy, you need to ensure that Rome gave you enough time and space to disembark and set up camp. So, in short, it wasn't ever an option, and that's why Hannibal had to march his men all that way. The exact route isn't known. The most famous part of this was the crossing of the Alps, and this too remains a hotly debated topic. But we know that Hannibal marched north, crossed the Pyrenees and moved across the south of modern-day France. He then crossed the Rome Valley before making that famous crossing over the Alps. Then he descended into the Po Valley, probably near Turin. This is approximately a thousand miles or 1600 kilometers and I know that I've got listeners across the world so I thought I'd see what that was like in terms of marching between cities outside of Europe. Give or take a few steps, it's around the same as walking from New York to Tampa Bay in the USA or from Las Vegas to Dallas. Travelling south from Cairo, it would get you to Khartoum in Sudan, and for our friends down under, think of walking between Adelaide and Brisbane. Now, the subject of numbers allows me into a segue of sorts, into the speculation over the size of the force which started that march. Polybius, a Greek historian, and one of our two main surviving sources for Hannibal's campaign, wrote that the infantry was 90,000 strong, with 16,000 cavalry. After crossing the Pyrenees, this was diminished somewhat to 50,000 infantry and 9,000 cavalry. The force which crossed the Rome Valley was smaller still, at 38,000 infantry and 8,000 cavalry, and the final force which descended the Alps in October or November 218 was 20,000 infantry and 6,000 cavalry. The reduction in numbers has been explained through desertion and death. After all, there was fighting on the march with tribes, particularly in the Alps but there would have been attrition from people either dying naturally or deserting. And on that point, Hannibal himself apparently sent home 10,000 Iberians because he was concerned they might rebel. There's also a suggestion that some were stationed along the route in order to secure it as a supply line, though I should add that this is contested. Crossing the Alps cost Hannibal dear. According to Polybius, he descended the southern slopes with an army of those 20,000 infantry, consisting of 12,000 African troops, and 8,000 Iberian troops, and those 6,000 cavalry. This number is actually less speculative than the previous ones given, as Polybius wrote that this was recorded on a column at Licinium. The march itself was full of encounters, and a few near ones with Rome. I realise in all of this, I haven't mentioned Rome much. Rome was aware of what was happening, and the consul Publius Cornelius Scipio had led a force which had tracked Hannibal in and around the Rome Valley. And in one instance, 
he led a force which defeated the Carthaginian cavalry and came close to catching Hannibal, who wasn't interested in fighting. He needed to get across the Alps as soon as possible and into territory which would give him some reprieve. And that's because northern Italy, or what became Cisalpine Gaul, wasn't Roman. It was instead the home of a number of Celtic tribes, such as the Boi and Insubres. These tribes were age-old enemies of Rome. In 390, they'd actually sacked it. More recently, in 225, a confederation of Celtic tribes had risen and moved south through modern-day Tuscany and fought Rome at Telamon. The result was a defeat for the Celts, and in response, Rome had been inching northwards. Colonies at Placentia, modern-day Piacenza, and Cremona resulted, and these became areas contested between Rome and the Celtic tribes. All of these events weren't unknown to Hannibal. In fact, prior to setting out on his march, he'd been in contact with the tribes. He'd sent embassies and gifts in an attempt to forge an alliance. And this had been successful. I'd expect the Celts knew about Hannibal and heard of the rise of Carthage, albeit in Spain. If the saying, the enemy of my enemy as my friend is true, then Hannibal and the Celtic tribes were absolute besties. Of course, there were concerns on the part of Hannibal. The Celts could be a great addition to his effort, both in offering safe passage and as a recruitment option, but they would only respect success. If Hannibal looked to fail or wavered in any way, then his army would become a very attractive proposition to them, for all the wrong reasons. Luckily, Hannibal had an early opportunity to demonstrate his abilities. After resting his men and gathering supplies, he moved to the nearby base of the Taurini, probably modern-day Turin. The Taurini hadn't been friendly and were enemies of the Insubres, as you might have guessed, the Celts were often at war with each other. After a three-day siege, Hannibal took the capital and slaughtered anyone standing, and this had the intended effect of proving himself to the wider Celtic community. And here's a good place to pause and listen about a podcast that you might be interested in. For 2,000 years, study of the Greek and Roman worlds has been at the centre of Western education. Chameleon Classics is the podcast that asks why. What is our fixation with classics? And why does the classical world only seem to encompass Greece and Rome? How can ancient history shed light on the fight for a fairer society today? And what responsibility does it bear for the complicated legacy of colonialism that we struggle to face up to, even now? I'm host and producer Shivek Shah, and in each episode, I speak with an expert in the field about some of the most urgent questions facing the study of classics today. Our discussions range from the overlooked complexity of race relations in the classical world to the chilling legacy of classics in global colonialist projects from the dramatic impact of Euripides' stage play Medea to the present-day efforts to make classics more accessible. Whether you're a long-standing classics student or a curious beginner, this podcast is for you. Episodes of Chameleon Classics are available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Find out more at chameleonproductions.org. That's K-H-A-M-E-L-E-O-N productions.org. As ever, if you want to swap promos or just have your Ancient History podcast featured, let me know. And yes, it's all free. Hannibal now had a force operating in northern Italy, one which had been honed by continual marches and fighting. I've so far spoken about numbers and broader categories of units, such as infantry. But what was his army composed of? What would Rome be facing? I'll start with the infantry, which were predominantly split between the African and Iberian, and I'll start with the African troops. When Hamilcar had first arrived in southern Spain all those years ago, he had taken this troop type with him. Perhaps there were some soldiers in the current army who'd actually belonged to that original group, but the majority would have been recruits sent over to southern Spain, and who would have fought there? These soldiers were sword-based infantry, from what we can tell, and would have had a shield with minimal armour. The Iberian troops were similar in many regards. I say Iberian, but these came from different tribes, and again I'm using the word Iberian as a kind of catch-all. They were either mercenaries or supplied to Hannibal as part of military tribute. Iberia at this time was given to numerous tribes who were often at war with one another, and as such, they're ideal for Hannibal. A particularly nasty-looking sword they used was called the Falcata, but they also brought with them a straighter blade. This so impressed the Romans that after the Second Punic War they adopted and then adapted it. What resulted was the Gladius Hispaniensis. This translates as the Spanish sword. 
or the Gladius, to you and me. It changed in size and shape over time, but it was this weapon which would become the iconic sword of the Imperial period, and the one you're probably most familiar with. Both the African and Iberian troops were therefore high quality, and by this point, far more experienced than their Roman counterparts could ever hope to be. Adding to this blend was the Celtic infantry. These started to join up with Hannibal, and though they hadn't been on the march with him, they were still very useful. The Celtic tribes had a martial culture, much like the Iberians, in that they advocated fighting as a cornerstone of who they were. The basics for a Celtic warrior at this point would have been a sword, possibly a spear, and a large shield. And, by the way, they really hated Romans. The Celts also allow a segue into the cavalry because they supplied strong heavy cavalry, and by that I mean that they were capable of charging and getting stuck into the enemy, either on the horse or dismounting. This differed somewhat from Hannibal's other cavalry, possibly the most famous of his cavalry and troops in general, the Numidians. The Numidian cavalry fought differently and relied on the mobility and skill of the riders to get near to a unit and pepper it with javelins and then move on. They could fight from horseback, but their primary attribute was mobility, to get round an enemy and attack from behind, and much of Hannibal's strategy relied on manifesting this type of situation. I should add that there was also Iberian cavalry, which is akin to the Celtic, in that it would fight up close and very personal. Giving further diversity in both of what they could do and where they came from were the Balearic slingers. These hailed from the Balearic Islands east of Spain, and you'd have, you'd have heard of one of these islands, I'm sure. Ibiza. And I say hailed specifically because skilled slingers could be devastating if used correctly. Slings might sound a bit old fashioned even at this time, but they were very dangerous. Balearic slingers were renowned for their accuracy and they carried three slings each, presumably for different ranges, and could use either lead bullets or stones. And these could cause a multitude of problems for anyone on the receiving end. At worst, they could kill if they struck you on the head. But even if they didn't, perhaps you were wearing some form of a helmet, there would probably be a concussion. And if you were hit elsewhere on the body, you could probably suffer a broken bone. And above all of this was the psychological impact. The slingers could pin down a heavily armed unit and keep it occupied knowing that it couldn't get anywhere near them. These were added to Hannibal's light infantry, whose main job was to keep the enemy bothered and harassed from a distance. Finally, the elephant in the room, and I mean that. Elephants. Hannibal had 37 elephants at Trebia, and I recorded an episode on the war elephant, and in short, they're often more dangerous to the side using them as the ones they were fighting. And the irony here is that Hannibal is really strongly associated with the elephants, but they didn't have much of an input in any battle he fought with Rome. This force was one which Hannibal needed to bring against Rome in some form or another, and he was matched in this attitude by the Roman consul Scipio. He'd brought an army north and was looking to catch the Carthaginian force which had evaded him near the Rhone and appeared. After hearing of his achievements against the Taurini, Scipio took his men and marched them along the Po River before building a pontoon bridge to cross the Ticinus River, a tributary of the Po. It was near the Ticinus, or modern-day Ticino, that Hannibal and Scipio crossed paths, almost literally. Both were aware that the other was near, but Neither knew exactly how close up until intelligence came through to their respective camps that the other was really close. Both sides made ready and assembled a force composed mainly of cavalry to find out exactly where the other was, and they ran headlong into each other. This became known as the Battle of the Ticiners, something of an exaggeration, as it was really just a clash between the two scouting parties. But Hannibal was able to pin Scipio's smaller force and then get his Numidians round the rear. Scipio received a nasty leg injury and only just made it out. According to the anecdote, it was his son Scipio, the Scipio who was later to take the war to Carthage in Spain and face Hannibal at Zama, who saved his father. Scipio quickly broke camp and retreated back across the Ticinus, breaking up the small pontoon bridge he'd made to ensure that the pursuing Carthaginian army couldn't follow him. And this might sound a bit of an overreaction, but the landscape where he'd camped was wide and flat, perfect for Hannibal's cavalry, which he now realised the importance of. Things were to get worse for Scipio. His next camp was made near a Placentia, where he intended to reset and work out his next move. But disaster struck, and this time it was the Celts, 
Even though Rome had fought against the Celtic tribes, there were some tribes allied to Rome and who fought on the side of Rome. A number of these decided to defect to Hannibal. After waiting to the middle of the night, they slaughtered the sentries and many of their Roman colleagues. Cutting off their heads, they disappeared into the November night and headed to Hannibal. Scipio realised that the situation had worsened and also that the Celts were likely to cause further problems. Breaking camp once more, he moved south, crossing the Trebia and picking a hilly spot to camp on. This, he thought, would at least prevent Hannibal's cavalry. But as we'll see, the defensive position was never going to be a factor. As much as Scipio was suffering, Hannibal's fortune and stock was rising. He took Clastidium, modern-day Casteggio, which was primarily a grain depot, and it wasn't just the supplies which were coming in thick and fast. The boy, a large Celtic tribe, brought Roman prisoners to Hannibal and declared a formal alliance. Scipio was joined at his camp by his fellow consul, Tiberius Sempronius Longus, who had been posted to Sicily with his army. The expectation would be that both consuls would decide the military strategy from this point on, but with Scipio sidelined with an injury, the events would be largely led by Longus. Longus is given to us as a very different character to that of Scipio. He was feisty and impetuous. We might picture the pair of consuls as a squabbling couple, perhaps more suited to an 80s sitcom trope than leading Rome's armies. Scipio had seen up close what Hannibal was capable of, and so seems to have respected him and advocated for a much more cautious policy. This is certainly, anyway, how Polybius paints the pair, but there may be a bit of propaganda behind all of this. A point Goldsworthy makes is that Polybius, who largely sets the scene between the two, was a good friend of Scipio Aemilianus, a later relative of Scipio, so it wouldn't be unreasonable to think that Polybius fashioned an image of Scipio with hindsight duly applied. Longus, after all, was acting within the social and political expectations of the time. Firstly, he was Roman, and Rome beat Carthaginians. Secondly, he was a consul. For any consul, the opportunity to beat a Carthaginian force which had allied with Celts and had put one consul out of action, well, it was as good as it could ever get. This was a dream ticket, and Longus must have been thinking of everlasting glory. He just had to kick this pup upstart back over the Alps. The thing worth knowing about consuls and the political system which they were a part of was that this temporary role, for 12 months after all, was where you could amass fame and fortune. Becoming a consul usually meant you'd spent large amounts of money, often borrowed, and you'd called in a lot of favours and put several noses out of joint. It was important then to try and ensure everyone got what they want because after the 12 months, you could be held accountable for your actions. It's an odd analogy, but I think of it as akin to a timed supermarket trolley dash. This was your chance to pay anything back kiss all those disjointed noses better and try to make yourself as politically safe as possible for when your term ended. The political setup of Rome encouraged this kind of short-term success gathering, wherever it could be found. Longus and Scipio were both deep into the terms of their consulships. Soon they'd need to return to Rome to oversee the elections of the next consul to take charge, who would do so in mid-March. So when Scipio apparently advised Longus to caution, to keep the men in camp and train them, you can understand why Longus felt these were the words of a jealous colleague who didn't want the glory to fall solely to him. Events were to conspire which would further convince Longus of his policy to engage Hannibal as soon as possible. In response to a Carthaginian raiding party, Longus set out a force to intercept it, which it duly did. Events, as they say, escalated and it seemed for a moment that this might become the definitive battle. However, Hannibal pulled his men back in a retreat. Longus understood this as you might expect him to, not as a skirmish to understand and rationalise how he had won, but a full-blown victory in itself against Hannibal. It vindicated his view that this was his moment in time. But for Hannibal, the clock was also ticking. Much of his campaign was built on momentum, particularly with the expectation of his Celtic allies on his shoulders. He needed a battle, and had a general in the form of Longus as easy as any debate. He just needed to pick where the victory would be. And here I think it's worth giving an overview of the force Hannibal would be fighting. In short, 
Rome's army at this point was not the professional empire-building outfit you might be familiar with. These were largely farmers and other citizens who fought when charged to do so, and whilst they were certainly capable, I want to draw that distinction between this period and the later professional armies. Broadly speaking, the soldiers fell into three types of infantry, the Hastati, Principes and Triari. Both the Hastatis and Principes were sword-based infantry, the difference between them being the armour worn and the respective ages. Hastati were the young men who fought in the front line, as mentioned, with a sword and a shield. They had a helmet, and at most, a metal plate covering their chest. Principes may have had mail, were certainly older, and definitely fought in the second line, and I say may because this army supplied its own equipment. The Triari were a throwback to the spear-based infantry Rome once fielded. They were veterans, probably in age, more than experience. These men fought in the third line, hence the Roman saying, going to the Triari, which meant something like going to the wire, or down to the last man. Lastly, and certainly least, there was the cavalry. But this was for those who could afford a horse. They weren't on a horse by virtue of being excellent horsemen. And this weakness in cavalry, both numerically and in terms of quality, was to have a big effect. Perhaps then it's easy to see why Scipio was so hesitant at putting these men into the field. It may have been a capable force in some regards, but Hannibal certainly had a better quality of troops, and more importantly, a force which had been on campaign and fighting for several months. Between the two camps ran the river Trebia. This time of year it was swollen with the ice and snow, and it wasn't just associated with the battle by virtue of its geography. As you'll hear, Hannibal began to draw on the elements themselves and geography of the area to their maximum effect against Rome. After scouting the area, Hannibal noted a feature which was to prove decisive. A stream bed his side of the river ran tandem to the river and to the west of his camp. Any Roman force crossing the river would then move past this. It was a perfect spot to hide troops, who would then fall on the Roman rear once it was engaged with his main army. So under the command of his brother Mago, 1,000 cavalry and 1,000 infantry were posted there the night before the battle. Daybreak on the 21st of December, the date traditionally given for the battle, is around 8 o'clock in the morning. And it was at this time which Hannibal reportedly sent his Numidian cavalry over to the Roman camp. A short assault did its job. They were there to rouse Longus into action. He duly assembled his army and marched out to meet Hannibal. Though Longus had supreme confidence in his men and his ability, he hadn't checked the details. His men hadn't had time to have breakfast and were marching through the freezing sleet. In stark contrast, Hannibal had ensured his men had eaten and were warming themselves, and this detail would doubtless have consequences. The march, the fording of the river, and assembling the Roman army in formation on the wide plain in front of Hannibal's camps took several hours. Men were doing this, freezing cold and on empty stomachs. And they were suffering from that river crossing. Polybius mentioned how this affected the men, the cold water exacerbating the near freezing conditions. And Livy went further to describe the condition of the men as they followed the Numidian cavalry back to Hannibal and forded that river. And I quote, There was not a spark of warmth in their bodies, and the nearer they approached the chilling breath of the water, the more bitterly cold it became. But worse was to come, for when in pursuit of the Numidians, they actually entered the river. It had rained in the night, and the water was up to their breasts. The cold so numbed them that after struggling across, they could hardly hold their weapons. In fact, they were exhausted, and as the day wore on, hunger was added to fatigue. It was in such a condition that the Romans formed up on the plain, having forded the Trebia. The infantry numbered 36,000, 16,000 of which was Roman, and 20,000 allied. The allies were placed on either side of their Roman colleagues, and the 4,000 cavalry were split and placed on the wings. Some 40,000 men made up the Roman army that day, and Goldsworthy estimated that the front line of the infantry measured two miles. To meet them, Hannibal deployed his army in a single line. His infantry consisted only of 20,000 men, with around 8,000 Celts in the centre, and the African and Iberian infantry either side of them. 
On the flanks, though, were the elephants and 5,000 cavalry on either wing. With the 8,000 light infantry, including the Balearic slingers, the numbers of the two armies were similar, but the composition was vastly different. The opening moves were made by the light infantry. For Rome, this was probably drawn from the Allied troops, whereas Hannibal had the units I've specifically mentioned. The effects of the weather and the crossing became apparent at this point, and Livy wrote how javelins had been impaired by the water, and the state of the light infantry can only have been substandard. When the Roman infantry charged Hannibal's light infantry, it withdrew to the flanks, and so began the Battle of the Trebia with both infantry meeting. Hannibal's advantage was with his cavalry, both in numbers and quality, and it was on the flanks that Hannibal focused his efforts. His centre was unlikely to ever compete with Rome, which even now had the simple tactic of becoming a meat grinder, which looked to chew slowly through the enemy line. But Hannibal had no expectation that he could match Rome there, even with his quality of troops. But then he didn't need to, he just needed to hold it. Hannibal's cavalry and light infantry on the flanks were quick to force the Roman cavalry back and sent it galloping away. The flanks of the Roman army were now horribly exposed. The Balearics used javelins in their slings. The cavalry either engaged properly or darted in and out with their javelins. It was mainly the Allied forces which were now being hit on those flanks, and they couldn't push forward any more. They had to turn outwards to meet the peril there. Things must have looked bad at that point for Rome but then Mago appeared at the rear of the Roman army. Polybius wrote that the response to this was that it threw the army into confusion and disarray. Any army would have issue with such a development. Perhaps a more experienced and well-drilled one might be able to counter it in some way, not because of weapon proficiency, but in the context of an experienced army being familiar with how a battle might sway in terms of momentum. And I've mentioned experience a few times, and in this context, it's important to understand it. Experienced soldiers could hold a line and understood that by not breaking, they were always going to increase their chances of survival. But not this army, not one which was less experienced. It was hungry and it was half frozen. Mago's force was the lid on the box, or more accurately, the final nail in the coffin. The Roman force now fragmented into a blizzard of men running for their lives. Some made it to the river and passed the cavalry but then many drowned trying to cross. The weather, which had done so much for Hannibal, now prevented his men from chasing down what was left. Testament to Rome's bulldozer tactics was a unit of 10,000 men which had broken through the Carthaginian line, and realising what was going on behind them, they just marched to Placentia and safety. Casualties are very difficult to estimate, particularly in a time where more died from wounds suffered days later than on the actual day of the fighting. Polybius subtracted the 10,000 who made it through to Placentia and commented that the majority of the remainder died that day. So if we take the lowest figure it could be, it's around 15,000 men. Hannibal also suffered, but mainly animals, particularly the elephants. And the casualties mainly come from the Celtic forces assigned to the centre. Perhaps this is why they were placed there. It signalled to the Celtic allies that he had faith in them and diplomatically would have scored points, but on a practical level it also made sense. Hannibal knew the Roman tactic of pushing through the centre, so placing troops he could more easily replace there, rather than the Iberians or African troops, was a sound decision. Post-battle, Hannibal was left to recoup and rest his men, the weather having taken its toll, even with all the precautions he had taken. Longus actually survived, and got back to Rome and tried to spin a tail there, that the battle was kind of 50-50 and interrupted with a storm and that the outcome wasn't particularly clear. But as stragglers returned, the truth came out and Rome began to sense that they were in a state of near emergency. Fortunately, they had the rest of the winter to recruit and kit out a new army to send out with the upcoming consuls. However, history was to repeat itself in a number of ways. By the summer of 217, Hannibal had undertaken another demanding march. He'd also fought a Roman army, and there was another body of water clotted with Roman dead. This was the Battle of Lake Trasimene, and it will be up next, so subscribe to this podcast if you haven't done so already. And if you've enjoyed this episode, despite the somewhat macabre content, 
then feel free to come and find me and say hi or share it or review it or do whatever you do when you like what you listen to. More importantly, until then, take care, avoid freezing waterways and stay safe.